Well, welcome uh, to this Farm Doc Daily webinar. Where are we at financially on Illinois farms? Our presenters today will include Gary Schnitke, Nick Paulson, and Brad Zwilling. Dale Latz is not available for us uh, this afternoon. Again, you'll be able to ask questions at the end of the webinar if you're watching live, of course, and naturally you can find this uh, online if you'd like as well. So go ahead and uh, make sure uh, that you put those questions in when you get the chance. Now, I'd like to get started, so we will move on. Let's get started with the programming. Brad Willing is going to, or Zwilling is going to kick us off. Uh, good morning to you, Brad. Thanks for being with us. Can you tell me about the uh, topics that we'll be covering for the day? I can, Todd. Yeah, so first we're gonna uh, start out, we're gonna talk about the current situation, where we've been um, by looking at some Illinois FBFM farms through 2019. And then we're going to move that over and look at the diversity diversity across farms um, by age, by type, and to look and see how those impacts those um, outcomes. And then we're going to go into what what are suggestions moving forward um, to figure out, you know, financially on Illinois farms, what we can do to make ourselves in a better place. So with that, let, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Illinois farm business, farm management. Um, their data is used to uh, create a lot of this uh, information we're going to share today. It's an independent third party. That means that we work with our clients and we're not trying to sell any product to them beside the services that we can provide. So we aid in record keeping um, and help make farm financial management decisions for our farmers. Um, we use those records to make those decisions. Um, we provide comparison and trend data, um, and that's comparisons of the farmer's data to other farmers that are the similar same type um, region of the state and uh, size. And then we also do trend data comparing their own information to themselves, um, as well as comparing the trends of other farms in their areas, type and size. Um, our field staff, that's the name of our, the people that we have throughout the state, they meet one-on-one, -on -one, three to five times a year. That's been a challenge for us in these COVID times. Uh, we've been doing lots of Zoom meetings with our farm clients out there and it, it makes it interesting uh, to see that technology work on the farm. And then we have about 65 plus field staff across the state that work one on one with those farms. Um, with in our averages, we have about 5,500 farms across the state of Illinois, from north to south. 50% of those, on average, um, get into our source that we use to generate the data that we're going to show and present today. Um, to find out more about Illinois Farm Business Farm Manager, you can visit our website, fbfm.org. Um, we are affiliated with the University of Illinois. My office is located on the University of Illinois campus. We work very closely with. Um, the farm doc crew and team and work uh, very closely to work with that data and help aid farmers um, move forward in their financial operation and their farm financial operations. So just to take a, just a reminder of what 2019 was like, uh, 2019 was a very challenging year. You know, we had a very wet spring, prevent plant acres, you know, uh, high corn drying costs, you know, because of that late planting and, and just the maturity of that crop. Um, we had lower yields, um, and then we had that second round of MFP payments that happened in 2019. So with all that in mind, you know, our accrual income, this is an accrual income, so we look at not just the cash portion, but the accrual, the inventory adjustments, the prepaid, the accounts payable, accounts receivable, that dropped almost 40, almost in half. It was 137,000, almost 138,000 in 2018. You know, in 2018, we had high yields. We also had our first round of MFP payments, and it dropped down to all, about 71,000 in 2019. Um, a lot of that was to do, like I said, with the uh, extra cost. And then moving on, um, that net farm income um, of that number, 90% of it was due to FSA payments. When we talked about the MFP payment, so 64,000 on average was from government payments, so MFP, livestock, or CRP payments. So. If you took that off of that net farm income, you had less than $8,000 that was left. So almost break even if we wouldn't have had those government payments to help with that farm. And then as we look forward, you know, 2020, we already have the CFAP and some WIP Plus programs that we'll talk about um, a little bit maybe later. So taking that and looking at 2019 and looking at on trend, we look at uh, net farm income for the last 10 years as a trend. And then we compare that to our labor and management income. The difference between those two is taking out a charge, an economic charge for interest on equity capital. So that's the, after we take the debt off of the assets we own 
and putting an economic charge to that saying, you know, what's, what else could I invest that money in if I did, wasn't farming, what other kind of return I could get and take that off our income. And then also a charge for unpaid family labor. That might be our, our uh, spouse, our, our children. So having a charge for that. And then what's left is to pay for the operator's labor as well as his management ability. So we look at that, that goes from a high of almost 300,000 in 2012 down to a real, the lowest number in those 10 year picture of a negative, almost 3,015 to averaging out about 71,000. That's where we've kind of been in that time frame, about 2014 to 2019 is at 75,000 to 70 to 75,000 dollars. And you notice the difference is about 60,000 difference between that and then what's left over for the farmer to pay for his labor and management. So taking that and now looking at a little bit of a financial ratio um, is taking the um, percent of the net farm income as a percent of total gross on the farm. And this is accrual as well. And looking that over a 10 year panel, um, also it goes into that you know, ratio, what makes up gross is your interest, your operating expenses and depreciation. So as you look at that, we started as a high of a 35% back in 2011, dropped a little bit 12, go all the way down to 1.5%. So barely have anything left. As you remember from the chart before, it was a negative number. You got to remember depreciation is going to come out of that as well. And to a number about 8% in 2019. Generally in normal years, we like to see that about 20, 25%. As you can see, we've been hovering around probably on average about 15% the last five years. So you can see that it's been in these tighter margins where that net farm income has been as a percent of gross. So going back to the, the question kind of asked at the beginning um, is the debt to asset ratio um, and seeing where that was going to go. We didn't, we didn't get your answers, but um, this is kind of showing what has happened since all the way back to 1991. You know, that's uh, been, you know, first of all, the debt to asset ratio is just simply taking your debt divided by assets. It tells how much your lender has as a percent of your total assets. Um, you know, what you have debt on as far as the total assets. Um, this is for all farms, but primarily grain farms across the state. And this varies greatly by type and farm and age. And we'll talk about that when we get into diversity. Um, you'd like to see that around 30%, 20 to 30%. As you look at this trend, you have the first panel, which is the pre-ethanol, which slowly came down from 1991 to a period in 2012, which was you know, a high income year, a highest income year to about, two, about 20% in 2012. During that high price period, you can see how it really came down a lot. And then that lower price period, the last uh, five to six years, we've gradually came back up slowly and we're still that, you know, you look at that, it's, you know, it's still not very far. We're around that 20%. It's not moved very much, but coming up slowly, even these, even when we've had lower prices and our debt levels are starting to increase, but also during that time, our asset values are increased. So that's why it's slowly increasing and not as rapid as our levels have been increasing for debt. So if I, and another ratio to just look at is current ratio. This is kind of liquidity of the farming operation. Um, you know, that just takes the current assets divided by the current liabilities. Uh, a good good rule of thumb is to be at two to one. You know, um, that means you have twice the number of assets to cover the twice the, the amount of liabilities you have. Um, so if you look at the average column, which is the or average line, which is the gray column, we we'll go from a high of three in 2012 down to we're about two in 2019. So that means we we were in that good range of that. And it means you know we had plenty of current assets to meet our current liabilities. Current liabilities would be the current portion on our, our loans. It would be our real estate taxes um, and also be our interest payments that we need to make. And this same slide, we also kind of showed a little diversity and showed what's the high top 25% quartile compared to the average and then the lower um, quartile, the bottom 25% of our averages. So the top 25%, so the 25% of our farms had a, a a very high current ratio of almost six percent so that really hasn't varied much so that's it's interesting to see that high but then we also know we have ones that are really close to one and that lower 25 percent and one means i'm just barely making through i you know my working capital is going to be one means my working capital is zero um or really close to zero so that that means i just got enough cash to pay my current liabilities no nothing in the the farming operation if something comes up and we have additional debt or liabilities to pay for because we don't have any more working capital left. I'll turn it back to Todd. All right, so if you have questions, go ahead and write them into the question box. A couple, two or three have already come in. We'll get those answered. 
uh, during the webinar today. However, we do have another question for you. Who do you think will win the election? Not who you're going to vote for, but who you think will win the election. We get asked this question, Gary Snitke and Brad and Nick, all at in each of the webinars. Uh, and get this, um, we can't answer the question. And, and I, I don't mean we can't answer the question because we could probably, but we can't we can't actually take the poll. <laughs> so, so when the poll comes out, whatever the answer here comes out to the poll is uh, strictly everybody who is online uh, operating uh, from the remote sites for the webinar, with the exception of those of us who are uh, making the presentation. So about 75 percent of you have voted. And there are your results. 54% believe that Mr. Trump will continue to be the president of the United States, and 46% say that we'll have a new president uh, when we get to January of the 2020 year. Now, let's continue on. We're going to talk a little bit about diversity in financial positions. Nick, are you picking this up at this point? Yes. Thanks, Todd. Um, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, diversity with respect to you know how how much we see things varying on uh, individual operations around some of those averages that Brad was presenting um, kind of in the lead up to to this section. So you know we got a little bit of that, a little flavor for that in the uh, the last slide on liquidity that that Brad showed. So again, that was all FBFM farms combined, the average. And then what the, the top quartile looked like, as well as the, the bottom quartile um, looked like um, around those averages or around those medians for some of these financial characteristics. So first few slides, we're gonna look at kind of some of the same measures that, that Brad presented. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna split things out by farm type. Um, and maybe the, the first thing to, to notice here on this, this first slide that's gonna look at net farm income by farm type is uh, you'll notice that the, the green series, which is for the, the grain farms, or the farms classified as grain operations in the FBFM data, they track very closely to what the all farm average is. And that's, that's an artifact of um, you know, the, majority, the vast majority of farms enrolled in FBFM, the, the data that that, that that association puts together is for grain operations. Um, but we can see that there is um, some, some diversity across farm types here in these net farm income numbers. Um, across the last uh, five years, uh, grain farms have kind of typically been the, the higher uh, income farm types, um, with the exception of 2017, where, where, where beef had a, a more profitable year, hogs were slightly more profitable than grain. Um, but in general, we see dairy, beef, and hog operations with, with lower net farm income levels over the last five years um, and uh, you know, more volatile uh, net farm income over that five year period um, as well. Um, if you wanna go on to the, to the next slide. Um, so here's another look at, again, what Brad ended with on liquidity. So here's a, a look at current ratio uh, by farm type. So we see that, you know, if you remember the all farm average, I think was right at or just below two. Uh, we see grain farms in 2019 at an average uh, of 2.05. And we see liquidity levels on all of the all three of the livestock uh, farm operation types slightly lower than that. Um, in, in all farm types, we've seen you know, trending downward since that um, high grain price period um, that, that, that ended in that 2012-2013 in that timeframe. Um, you know, we can we can see in general uh, liquidity has been lower on livestock operations uh, going back even even 12 years um, uh, from 2019. And you know, hog operations and and dairy operations in particular are probably in the weakest uh, state in terms of liquidity on average. Uh, beef uh, only slightly better, and then grain kind of just right at that zone where. Um, as Brad said, we we kind of view that level of two to one on the current ratio as being a um, kind of where you want to be at to be considered to be in a in a fairly solid liquidity position. And then in, I think the next slide um, we'll take a look at here is the the solvency picture again by farm type. Um, you know, going back again to those all farm averages Brad referred to uh, for 2019 of around 20 
21% uh, for a debt to asset ratio. Uh, grain is right at that all farm average. Uh, beef operations are, are right at that all farm average, slightly above that all farm average as well. And then we see higher leverage uh, levels on average um, for, the, for the dairy operations in the state, um, as well as the hog operations in the state. And, you know, the, the trends are, are important. Um, so, you know, even the levels uh, for, for hog operations, I think, are, are starting to get more in the concerning zone on average. Um, and then when you couple that with the, the pretty consistent trend that we've seen over the last five years of, of moving up, um, you know, combining those two things does does cause some concern. Um, you know, obviously a different picture when we're looking at just grain farms or all farms where, while we are seeing a, a, a gradual trend up over the last five years, still in a, um, a pretty sol solid solvency position. And, and just to reiterate one of Brad's points, you know, we're seeing debt increase in terms of total dollars um, across farm types. Um, but the one thing that, that grain operations are you know, also benefiting from, from a, from a financial perspective is we've seen you know, solid uh, continued increases or at least stability in land values that has helped kept their uh, relative debt levels um, you know, not moving up quite as quickly as some of the other, some of the livestock farms, which, which maybe don't have that big of a, a farm real estate buffer to kind of, to kind of balance out some of those uh, increases in absolute debt. Um, the other thing that we, uh, if we move on to the next slide, the other uh, kind of breakout, um, you know, in, in kind of getting away and just looking at the all farm averages is what solvency looks like for different age categories. Um, and, and probably not surprising, we see uh, the older operators, uh, the more established operators, the operators who have been farming for longer and have paid down, uh, had the opportunity to pay down their debt levels over, over more years. Uh, do have the strongest uh, position with respect to debt to assets. Um, so those operators in that in that 60 plus age range, around a 10% debt to asset ratio, uh, compared to the youngest operators um, in FBFM uh, with a debt to asset ratio around 50% for that under 30 category. And you can see that you know it's it's a pretty consistent increase or decrease in leverage as we as we go through those. Uh, those 10 year age groups, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and then 60 plus. Um, Brad can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the average age of FBFM operators is typically around in that 58 to 60 range. Um, yeah. You know, half, half of the operators are in that 60 plus category. Um, uh, you know, uh, so that's kind of another way to look at this chart. But, but again, it is, um, it is, it is, it is something to keep in mind that you know again, not not a surprising thing, but it's the, it's the younger farms that that are uh, you know in that in that more vulnerable uh, position with uh, in terms of relative debt uh, to assets uh, uh, perspective. Um, and then I think the next slide is um, a table um, that just shows you you know some of the other characteristics and kind of how they break out across um, solvency categories. So on the far left. Um, this table is kind of organized by the debt to asset ratio, um, and I'll, I'll point out a few things here. Again, not not real surprising the, the correlations between solvency and some of the er other characteristics that were included here, um, but I think still important to remind ourselves of. So, uh, you know, the top two rows are in green. That's that's kind of the farms that are in a pretty strong solvency posi position. Um, if you add up the percent of farm numbers, that's that's close to 60% of the farms are, are in that debt to asset ratio less than 30%. Those farms tend to have better liquidity as well, uh, greater levels of working capital, obviously, uh, another another liquidity measure. Um, they, they tend to rent uh, less land uh, than some of the farms in the higher debt categories, and especially the, the ones in the, in the more problematic higher debt categories. Um, in, in red there at the bottom. Um, and of that land that they rent, a, a smaller portion of that land is rented under a cash rent agreement. Um, and they're also, um, you know, again, older, uh, older operators tend to have um, lower, uh, lower debt to asset ratios as well. So, you know, again, I think these are, are themes that we're all pretty familiar with if, if you're involved in agriculture. 
Uh, it's natural, I think, for the for for the younger generation of farms to be carrying a higher debt load uh, for for various reasons. Um, but you know, I think that the correlation between solvency and liquidity um, is important here. The other thing that that I, I hadn't really mentioned yet, but is also included, is is farm size. Um, and we see that the the farm, you know, that's actually a little bit smaller farm size is associated with a, a stronger solvency position here. Not a huge range in the average tillable acres across these uh, solvency categories, but you know, 16, 1700 acre farms in those in those stronger solvency positions, and then you you get into the the 2000 acre range um, for the the farms with with uh, with greater uh, relative debt loads. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about how we're, you know, right now we're still not in a solvency crisis. Um, you know, and again, that's largely because we've, we've, we've got continued support with, with, with land values. Um, it is more on the liquidity side. Um, so that's why I do think it is important to just recognize that, you know, those, those two things are not independent. The, the farms that are in weaker liquidity positions are also the ones that we would typically categorize as, as having the, the weaker solvency positions as well. Um, so with that, I, th I think the, the next slide is our, our next poll. I'll turn it back over to Todd. You bet. So go ahead uh, and take this poll. Thank you. If you've got questions for Nick Paulson, make sure you put them in the questions section and we'll get that taken care of here in just a bit. Who would be better for agriculture if they win the election? Donald Trump, Joe Biden, or it simply does not matter. Go ahead and uh, put uh, your answer into that uh, poll. About 65% of you have voted so far, going along quickly, and we'll get an answer for you momentarily, and then we'll pick back up with some suggestions uh, for moving forward and probably talk more about solvency as well. So there are your answers. 56% say that uh, President Trump would be better for agriculture going forward. 24% say Joe Biden. And about 20% of you say it just does not matter. So let's move forward. Suggestions uh, for what can be done. And I think Gary Schnitke, you'll pick up and we'll begin, uh, continue to talk about solvency and other issues here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. And thank you for answering our poll today. Now we have the official answer. So now as we move forward, we'll be, we'll know <laughs> uh, what to say when we have those questions. Um, we get those questions asked a lot. So suggest, and obviously they're important, particularly given that much of our, as you saw in our previous uh, 2019, much of our income was a result of federal aid. It will likely be the case. And 2020 as well as far in as well as 2021. So as we're moving forward here, I'm first going to talk about what we're going to look at, likely look at at the end of the year. And you already get got the dimensions of, of who likely is having the going to have problems moving into 2021. So a uh, lender's going to look at so solvency, liquidity and profitability, debt servicing capabilities. Um, we know that on average, farms probably or don't have a have a solvency problem. Those farms that are more likely to have problems at the end of this year are likely to be hog farms, dairy farms, and then if we look at crop farms, the younger farms that have more of their their farmland rented, and in particular cash rented, but. Um, for the crop farms themselves, a lot of what we will look at at the end of the year depends a lot on whether we get another round of ad hoc disaster assistance. If we don't have that uh, that assistance, then we will have have a bit more problems and maybe have a bit more solvency problems. And if we do uh, do not get that, we will we we will have more problems. It is important though, and we've said this a number of times, to realize that we don't really have a solvency problem. Our debt to asset ratios are relatively low. They haven't come up. And even if we saw farmland prices decline, we wouldn't have a solvency problem. As uh, Bruce Sherrick said on our last webinar on Tuesday, and you can go back and look at that, we don't really believe that we have a farmland price decline in in the near future, maybe in the longer term, but our problem isn't solvency. 
where we are seeing the problems are debt servicing. And over time, we've seen our, our operating loan balances increase. Um, average last year on, on our grain farms was $303 per acre. Again, whether those increase on grain farms uh, this year will depend a lot on whether we have another round of ad hoc disaster assistance. Well, if we get that, um, those operating loan balances may, may stay abrupt where they're at. If we do not get that, they will rise. Um, those operating loan balances are growing over time, but not alarmingly so. And again, where we see most of that growth is in younger farms. If you're looking at uh, at, uh, at at grain farms, younger farms, and more of it cash rented. So those 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 are the operations that we're seeing that that more grow over time. Again, this year you'll likely see those operating loan balances grow on hog farms as well as dairy farms. The other item that we that the lenders will look at is liquidity. We've been measuring that by a current ratio. You can also state that by working capital. Again, that has been declining over time, but nothing alarming on average. Again, you see, as, as, as Nick showed on that one slide, uh, we see, we've we seen working capital being close to zero on our was close to zero and the debt to asset or excuse me the current ratio being close to one on some farms again they tend to have more of for grain farms they would tend to have younger operations and and more cash rented again those two seem to go together so those those are what we're looking at as on profitability liquidity and debt servings that service and again lenders will be looking at that particularly for grain farms at the end of the year when those loan decisions are being remade and a lot of on average where those go will depend on what is happening on uh, federal aid this year it does look like illinois will have reasonably good yields across the state so that will help us as far as income wise um, prices are still low Corn soybean prices are higher than maybe we would anticipate at this 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 point in time. And from an income standpoint, and while we 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 don't like what happened to Iowa, it didn't help, didn't hurt our incomes when we have less supply out there. As we're moving forward, we have a working capital cash flow problem, and um, we're going to talk through some of the things that farmers may may want to look at. Here's a diagram as we're talking about working capital. This shows working capital at the beginning of the year, at the end of the year, and then what will change it during the, during the year. The changes in cash in 2020, and again, that would be the same for any year. This is a counting identity. It happens to be the one that FBFM uses on their uh, financial statements, but those items, if, you, if those cash, from grain operations, cash from non-farm farm and non-farm enterprises, off-farm income. The sources of it are greater than taxes, family living, capital purchases, debt servicing in general, and net investment activity. Um, those will, if that, that that add up the positive, you'll see more working capital at the end of the year. So that's what we're looking at there. And now let's focus again so what 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 do we need to look at as as we're moving forward and managing that working capital i'm going to take that and then look at some of the changes in cash that we can be looking at and some of the items that we're going that we may be able to change i'm going to start here with cash from other farm and non-farm enterprises and if we look at our fbfm farms um uh, a very large proportion of them have some other farm or non-farm activity. And that is becoming more and more critical as, as we look at these grain operations and in particular for younger operations. Um, as we're looking at those operations or at those off-farm or non-farm enterprises, something that generates cash is a, it would be a good thing to have. And again, we have, 
we have some examples of those as seed input supply businesses. Livestock, be careful there, customer or otherwise. They're, they're, they generally, or we can see some cash from those. Custom farming, um, and again, we would say be careful there because you can run machinery over acres and uh, while you're spreading cost, if you're not generating enough revenue, we're also not uh, helping our cash situation. Again, on our farms, one of the things that we want to, many farms may want to think about, particularly the younger ones, is looking at those farm and non-farm related enterprises. For our, many of our farms, uh, off-farm income is a key, and many farms, again, have off-farm income. And one of the things, and this isn't no, this isn't a surprise, is that uh, getting health benefits on that off-farm income, having one uh, one person in a, of a couple working off farms in a job that have benefits greatly aids what we see happening on the farm. The minute we begin seeing farms having to pay for uh, health benefits, we see large, large, uh, large cost they're associated with those uh, those health benefits and often uh, not very, not, they're somewhat less than desirable health plans. Again, it's just a fact of the matter that in Illinois, we have some areas where the off-farm income is a possibility and getting those, building that into our operation in these days is something that we have to consider. One other thing that we would mention is family living, and actually family living has been coming down in recent years. It hit a high in 2013, and this is according to FBFM records, coming down, and we all know that uh, that those things are, um, that those are hard to come down, down, down. We would offer sort of two pieces of advice. Know what it is, and FBFM can help with that. There's a, there, there they, they, there is a, they do do family living, uh, accounting, and the other thing is budget it, and that's just Dave Ramsey. If you you uh, you uh, control what you monitor, and if you don't monitor it, you're not controlling it. So same thing with family living as with anything else. Finally, just going what we often talk about is cash from grain far farming operations. And again, the philosophy here, I guess we would say, is for a corn and soybean farmer, being a low cost producer is very important. Everybody has known that. Second point is, is you can't market your way out of the problems. Prices are what they are this year, and you might as well get used to what 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 they are and make that fit into your operation. We do still see some profitable investment opportunities on farms and here improvements on existing farm, anything that gets a, gets a more cash out of the existing farmland is a good thing. Drainage tile would be one of those things. We see grain storage work for some farms that are, that are, that, that want to make storage as a part of their operation that has worked. And we also mentioned specialty grains here. Point four and point five here, um, we know this. Most likely if we want to have a, a operation continue in the future, we need to have more revenue in the future, which means the need to grow the farm. Unfortunately, point five right now is also true. Renting farmland, uh, average cash rents is is not a money money maker. It's not going to generate cash. Um, so 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 the strategy of growing the farm, and this is this is the big issue. Right? But we see out out there, farms are need to grow, and the fun the the cost of the land to get it is marginal at best. So. While we do know, we, while we do know that, um, really be careful in these these this, this, these times with the cash rent uh, decisions, and making sure that the that those are aiding in um, in cash flowing the the operation at this point in time. We would describe divide this uh, advice up into 
by operation, young farmers, and again, we're looking at those as having uh, working capital issues, prior prioritized cash generating generating activities. Uh, middle aged farmers, uh, we would suggest evaluating the financial performance of segments of the business, making sure that they are generating uh, generating, generating um, cash. Older farmers, again, look at the segments of farmland. If you have no hairs. Um, you're in a good position. Look at whether all those operations are generating cash and older farmers and you want to continue on. It's time to do some succession planning. It's, it's very difficult and it's a good thing, but we also have to be careful here with what we're doing as far as making sure both the older farmers have an older generation have enough for, for, retirement as well as the younger generation have enough to survive we'll turn it back to todd here and we'll end this and then we'll get to questions hey thank you so much gary if you've got questions for gary or nick or brad go ahead and put those in the box and they'll go through them here in just a minute uh, i think probably brad will start with you so if you could pull a couple of those fbfm questions that are already out that would be good otherwise folks who uh have Written, uh, have questions, go ahead and write them into the box. One thing that we do want to do is uh, today is to say thank you uh, and to celebrate uh, for Todd Hubbs. He is leaving us here at the Farm Doc team, and we're going to miss him. Of course, he's uh, done the weekly outlook for the last four years uh, and I know has uh, cooperated with me. I talk to him most Mondays on the radio station. It's always really good to, to talk with uh, Todd. Uh, and just like uh, those in the past, he anchors me in because he's so fundamentally driven, meaning the fundamentals of the marketplace, it, it makes just a really big difference. And I know Nick and Gary and Scott have worked very closely with him. Brad, I'm sure that you have depended upon him as well. And uh, we're, we're just going to miss him greatly here at the University of Illinois and want to make sure that we thank him. We'd also like to take a moment and to thank our sponsor, Farm Credit Illinois, too. Uh, who helped to sponsor this particular program uh, and uh, is the webinar sponsor for this one. So let's go ahead and um, well, we'll get to the questions mm -hmm. now. Um, we'll begin with you, Brad. What'd you find in the questions? Yeah, there's quite a few of them in here and I'll let That's Nick right. and Gary get in there. They need to, you need to go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I'll read the question. What do you think the Chicago <laughs> Fed Reserve quarter, second quarter report of the share of farm loans with yeah. major severe repayment problems. Is this substantiated by your FBFM field staff? Um, you know, that's hard to tell. We're, we're still getting information from, from our field staff. You know, we don't collect that on a time, time by time basis, but we are talking to them. And there's some out there. Um, each one of our field staff probably are working with some of those. Um, you know, we've, we've been really hard at trying to get some things that are coming out with the PVP loans, the IDA loans, and helping with some of that to pay, use that debt use that to pay down some of that farm loans but yeah i think that's i think that's still out there i just don't know what percent our farms are that way gary or nick do you have anything to add to that one the one the one thing i would mention is that you know those issues will come up at the end of the year when we're looking at uh looking at renewal of loans and it's still key to see what cash flows are coming in yet so, and particularly what we're looking at as far as uh um ad hoc disaster pay, disaster payments. I would suggest that hog farms are gonna have issues. So hog farms uh, um, will have issues. And, and that kind of leads into the next question. Um, does our FBFM information support the July Purdue Ag Economic Barometer showing substantial um, uh, Corn Belt you know, farmers being worried or very worried over this year's profitability express more ad hoc payments are needed. And I, I agree with Gary that, you know, I, that's what we're hearing, especially hog farms are already just even the livestock farms are really worried about where we're going to be. I mean, grain farms are too, but those are the ones we're really hearing from. Yes, for those of you who don't know what that is, Purdue, uh, along with the CME group, every quarter put out a barometer and they survey, I want to say about 800 farmers uh and ask them you know do they feel good or better or worse about current conditions and so it's 
it really is a uh, it <laughs> by quarter you can almost see how how it ranges. Um, you know, most assuredly, once we get to the fall quarter, it will uh, tick up. It always has, so I can't imagine that it won't this quarter as well. So we'll see how that looks. Uh, next question: Do you have concerns over those younger farmers? off-farm and non-farm income in the face of COVID-19 resurgence uh, in some of the downstate communities? So that's kind of a question, Gary, I guess, about some of the outside income uh, and whether or not they might lose that uh, if we have a resurgence in COVID-19 and, uh, the, and the economy or the state begins to shut down some of those places where off-farm income comes from. And and y yes, you do have a concern about that because COVID nineteen is going to have impacts on off farm uh, or other farm in activities, and if we lose those, we 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 will hurt. Uh, we will hurt some of the uh, some of these farm operations. Moving into the future, you also get concerned about. The public sector. Um, what's going to a lot, a lot of farm families depend on jobs from um, state employment, either through schools or other other activities. And you know those the taxes are going to be much lower <laughs> moving forward. So we'll we'll see where where where, where that goes. Those off farm employment things, in my estimation, will become more pronounced in the future. I mean, we haven't seen the the tail or the 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 impact of of covid on off farm employment yet and that is coming. So, I Nick and Brad can chime in there, so I mean, I, this kind of goes back to all the questions so far. I mean, you know, everything we've presented today um, you know, all the all the data we can look at for for agriculture is is lagged. And you know, it's you know, so we're talking about what things looked like, you know, December 31st of 19, that was pre-pandemic. Um, you know, there are some indicators that are coming out, you know, the bag barometer is one of them that's that's more current, but um, you know, that's you know, eight months have, have gone by and we don't we don't know exactly what things look like at the end of 2020 until we get through harvest. Um, but indications are that we shouldn't probably expect significant improvements in, in any of the things that we talked about today. And just offhand, somebody did uh, jump in and made a correction uh, for me. Uh, the Purdue barometer is monthly, by the way, and uh, they say that about 400 farmers are pulled up check that of course and make sure all those numbers are right but I, that uh, that seems more likely to me than what i had given to you now gary what do you mean by looking at segments of farmland for succession planning for older farmers what are the segments <laughs> that, that uh, you want all right. to look at so so segments of business let me start start with those the, those farms that have no errors um and you're and Older farmer means you're financially solid, more or less, more more likely than not. I'm I'm, I'm making a generalization here, and now I would suggest you look at cash flow and what's generating cash flow, and that would include pieces of farmland. Are you re renting farmland that isn't generating a cash flow at this particular point in time? I would also look at other 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 parts of your business do you have off farm or other activities that are that are, may or may not be generating cash flow but for for a farm older farmer with a without heirs i would look at yeah I, I have this piece of land that i'm paying this cash rent for um am i is it generating any any sort of profitability move, moving for moving forward if we're looking at a situation where we have an older farm and then we have a younger operation in succession planning, one of the things that we have to think about is providing uh, revenue for the older older operation while having um, enough cash flow for the younger operation. And then if we have off farm um, children, we have to be concerned with equity for them themselves. Or, you know, 
it's likely that one of the things that you could do is reduce rental rates for the younger generation. And then what does that do for their total family situation? Those are tough decisions and tough, tough thoughts. Um, it's good to have a, have heirs that want to keep farming. And in those cases, we need to really begin to think about succession planning and being fair to all, all parties involved in that operation. Fred and Nick, have you gone back through questions? Do you have some things that you want to pull out and make sure we get answered before we run out of time today? Yeah, one, this is for Brad. Do you have a, our, our current ratios that top and bottom 25%, that's not the same cohort every year. Right, right. They can go in and out of there. Um, and yeah, so they go in and out of those groups. That's right. That's right. So it's not the same group of farms every year. And do we have a graph on current ratios by age category? We have the information. I don't know if I've got a graph, Gary, but we do do that. And it's, it's interest. I looked just the last two years while I've been talking here. Uh, it's interesting. The group thus than 30 seems to be, um, they're, they're a little bit more, they have a higher current ratio than the group from 30 to about 60. Those are all about the same. And then the 70 plus are, you know, cash flush. And I think that's where some of that showing up, you know, Nick talked about the average age of our farmers, you know, around that 60 age. So, um, but that it's, we do have the information. We do publish uh, financial characteristics of Illinois farms. Um, that one's not available yet, but that usually will show that breakout by age. So here's a question. How much of the current ratio stability is provided by refinancing debt over longer terms? that's that's a great question um we kind of look at that but it's it's hard to tell when we look like somebody mentioned something about the averages um we kind of watch also you know not only do we see the ratios we actually see the actual um averages of the long-term debt intermediate debt and the operating debt and we don't see a big influx of long-term debt without a long-term asset you know so there could be some of that that is correct that that is happening but um you know that that's going on there and i wanted to there's one other question about the the averages showing a lot of differences um you know these are medians so it kind of helps with that but you're right he still doesn't catch all the ups and downs and all the different sets of data yeah, and so, I, I was on, the, on the term on the term issue um you know anecdotally talking to lenders i, I had a uh, Somebody who works in lending come in and talk to my class in the spring, kind of towards the end of the semester, and talk about kind of the renewal cycle. And you know, th there is some there is some of that activity, but you know, like like Brad said, it's it's hard to to pick that up in an average across a, a group of farmers within the entire state. But you know, just like there's people above and below those averages, there are there are weaker financial positions where where that's happening. But you know, I I don't think any lenders are are you know describing that as as widespread and you know the, Gary used the word alarming a few times not alarming in his slides you know I, I don't think it's at the alarming stage yet but there is there is some of that going on and you're right Nick from what I known from talking to lenders that's they don't you're only going to do that one or two times at most so okay. you know okay. and that and that's kind of a last not a last case but one of the last things that they'll do so one other thing I would mention about refinancing is, yeah, yes, it's a, it, it does provide some, uh, some, uh, some relief on working capital. The other thing, though, is if you haven't eliminated the thing that caused the working capital need in the first place, all you're going to do is have to do it again. So while you're, while you're refinancing, you also will want to address why we're generating working capital declines. For some lenders, that's going to be very critical moving forward because some lenders will require a positive cash flow to be shown moving forward. So if you refinance and you're still showing negative cash flows, you still have a problem. So um, your, your, your cash flows are letting you deal with your problem in the future, and it's a good thing, but you have to still deal the deal with the problem. Um, 
I assume, so we have one question. I assume the percent cash rented acres are a percent of the rented acres. If you look at that graph, and it's the financial position of grain farms end of 2018, there's a percent rented and there's a percent cash rented. That's of tillable acres. So it's of tillable acres in that 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 graph. And we apologize for that uh, for not making that clear. Brad, how many total hog farms are there in the database, and are they all independent or are some contract with integrators? Yeah, that's a great question i i can speak to what farms are in our database that are certified usable um you know we're we're in that range probably that 30 to 40 range for those hog producers um most of the you know any contract finishing is not going to be those 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 could those will be independent or they will be um somebody that they're those pieces of data that are going through are the, you know maybe integrated with somebody but they own the animals going through we do have lots of them in there. We don't collect that information on those contract finishing, but there's a lot of, even some of our grain farms is gonna have some of those contract finishing arrangements, whether it's hogs or even uh, feeding out dairy heifers. So there's, there's those, you, those are fairly common throughout the data, yes. So, so just Brad, just, so if we're looking at grain farms, a lot of those grain farms would have a small livestock enterprise on the side and could also have a contract uh, finishing operation or, on the site as well. So it, it, now I'm looking at you making sure that I'm saying what I'm saying is right, right? And yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, we, uh, and I'll tell you the math, but you don't have to worry. But if 40% of their gross crop returns is fed to livestock, then we call them a livestock farm. So, you know, yeah, you can have a small livestock operation that um, on a grain farm and still be considered a grain farm. Nick Paulson, Brad Zwilling, and Gary Schnitke, thank you uh, for joining us today. Uh, thanks to all of those who have been on hand with us. If you've been watching for the full time, thanks to the farm credit folks. And of course, thanks to Jim Boltz, who's been behind the scenes and makes everything run really, really smoothly. Uh, we appreciate all the work that he does as well. And um, one last thank you. And that goes to Todd Hubbs for all the work he's done over the last four years. And sincerely, we will miss him. I'm University of Illinois farm broadcaster Todd Gleason. Wishing you a very good weekend.